What's going on, everybody? How you guys doing on a fine Sunday evening? Ross Jackson alongside me, John Hendricks, bringing you the very first episode of Second and Saints. We've kind of built this thing up. We're here. If you didn't make see the announcement, this is our new show that we're going to be running and all that fun stuff. Um, but, you know, before we get onto this fabulous Saints talk, Ross, I have to, to kind of pick a little bit. You had a really the like the most New Orleans thing to happen to you before getting into the, your house to the show. So yeah, tell that story. Yeah, this is what I get for look. I, I I knew that when I came back home and I came back to the city that I wasn't going to live outside of the city. I wasn't going to live you know away from the, the 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 rambunctious nature and the personality of the city. So I'm right in the thick of it. I'm in the sixth ward, sixth seventh ward, and. Um, there was like a big block party up underneath Claiborne, which is kind of like the big bridge that is effectively like that's the Claiborne is the, uh, the the road that runs on either side of the I-10, which is like right through the heart of New Orleans proper. Uh, and it took me about 20 minutes to get from like five minutes away to here because there was they had police all over the place, big old block party. People were twerking on the police cars while they were trying to drive by. It was the most New Orleans experience i've had a long time uh and i'm grateful that i made it through and made it here on time i was still five minutes early so i was good so uh yeah no it's it, it, it I, I am here fresh off the most new orleanian new orleans experience ever and i love it i'm glad to be here on the first episode man. look uh, it, to quote what in denver the ride never stops russell wilson ride, it never it never, it never stops. stops it never stops it right never and stops. so <laughs> it was fun times but again thank you guys for tuning in um you know we're gonna talk plenty of saints that's why we're here probably. And just, you know, again, we don't have any agendas here. We don't have any, like, we're not trying to compete with people. We're just two guys that love this team, love covering this team and are just passionate about what we do and give you some different insight um, from guys who are there and in the locker rooms, talk to coaches, all that fun stuff. So, you know, let, let's just kind of just jump into it. Yeah, Clint Kubiak, that's kind of big news, right? Saints offensive staff, it's a complete makeover, but you know, the obviously the the big one is Clint Kubiak. That's the one that's only been announced, right? We hear about the other ones that are coming and all that good stuff. But Clint Kubiak's here. Obviously, there's a lot of excitement. He's gonna work with Derek Carr a good bit and hopefully re-inject this offense. I mean, this offense has been what mostly the same since 2006, 2009. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. they made some changes, right? But yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. it adapts a different style of offense now for the Saints. Um, what can fans kind of expect from Clint Kubiak? What are you most looking forward to? Yeah, I think the big thing for me uh, is, you know, I kind of, I wrote a piece over at Saints News Network that kind of had the three elements that I'm most looking forward to. The first of which is misdirection. If you look at any type of Shanahan style system, misdirection is its trademark. It's its thumbprint, right? That, that's That's the whole thing. And for folks that are worried, that Clint Kubiak only spent one year under Kyle Shanahan. We have to remember, and I'm writing another piece about this right now, that the Kyle Shanahan system before it was Kyle Shanahan system was Mike Shanahan system, his dad's, which he developed alongside Gary Kubiak, Clint Kubiak's dad. So that's where that system comes from. Denver, a uh, little bit of uh, you know, it going on over at Houston, Kyle Shanahan starting under, you know, being over at in Houston with Gary Kubiak, all that. So yes, he, he's got enough experience in the sort of origins of the system to bring it. It's not just one year in San Francisco. So I think you're seeing the misdirection. You're seeing a lot of motion. The Saints used 14.3% motion last year, which is 28th, 26th in the NFL, somewhere in the sort of high 20s there, while San Francisco 49ers were 37.7%, John. That was second in the NFL. So a big time gap in between those. <laughs> And then the other piece of it for me was utility, right? The way that they utilize some of these players. You think about Debo Samuel, Brandon Ayu, Christian McCaffrey, even George Kittle to an extent, Kyle Juszczyk, all those guys kind of in, in their own little ways kind of fit that positionlessness tag. And I think that guys like Taysom, Alvin Kamara, Rashid Shahid all have that ability as well. I think that there's a lot of those pieces that you're going to see, play action, misdirection, doing things simply with a sort of, uh, air of complexity, right? Let me make you look in six different directions before I throw a slant. Like that's the kind of stuff that you're going to see from Clint Kubiak's offense. I expect, uh, I don't think it's going to work right away. Week one, I think it's going to take some time to grow into it a couple of weeks, but hopefully not 12, like what we saw last year, uh, before the <laughs> offense really gets rolling. So those are some of my expectations from a Clint Kubiak, New Orleans Saints offense. 
Yeah, it's funny because it was one of those things where they weren't using play action. They weren't using a lot of motion to start the year. I, I just don't understand that, you know, and, and obviously it grew as the season progressed. It's like, you know, I think what I like about play action and all those types of things, if you can get the defense off their game for just a half second, that means a lot. Right. Yeah. And so, I mean, there's just so much to come. Now I tell you one of the things that I'm really excited about and just watching Clint Kubiak. And I was looking at his time in Minnesota. One of the things I looked at, there was his offensive scheme where he lined up Justin Jefferson in the backfield and Justin yep. Jefferson is running a, a Texas route. So it's kind of like an angle route, but obviously for fans, it's kind of like you take one yard in and then you cut inside. Uh, and so one of those, he's a decoy and the other one, he actually hits a touchdown on it. And so it's just like that type of creativity, that type of stuff that, that can bring an exciting element to the table. Not only that, but it's also an effective one because you look at a guy like if it's a Rashid Shahid, you got to account for this guy. And if he's running yep. a, a, an angle or a angle or Texas route or something like that out of this offense. And you, I mean, you know how, how fast he can cut on a dime and stuff. Right. I mean, there's just so much that it comes through with that. And it's just one of the many examples They use misdirection. Obviously, you know, you look at some of the things in Minnesota, it wasn't the, the best. It wasn't perfect. Right. And, and of course nobody is, but again, just the simple usage of play action and motion, all these other things just to get the defense off of their element just for a little bit spells a difference. We saw it in the Super Bowl. You saw it with Brock Purdy. You saw it with what they were able to do with the Chiefs defense at times. Now, you know, we at Saints News Network, we picked the Chiefs to win that game. I mm -hmm. said Spags was going to be the difference. I, I just thought that that's what it was going to do. But, you know, you see those elements. Uh, what is something else maybe that San Francisco did or maybe something you took from that Super Bowl that, that may say, oh, well, I could see the Saints doing that. Yeah, I think the zone blocking in the run game is is a big one. And this kind of gets Alvin Kamara back to his bread and butter from 2017, 18, even mm. really 19, 20 a little bit too when he was working in concert with Latavius Murray, just having sort of that zone run scheme to where basically instead of the offensive lineman being concerned with blocking the defensive lineman that's directly in front of them, they're blocking a gap. So you're going to see them move. And then if there's nobody on the defensive line in that gap, then that offensive lineman shoots the second level, sometimes the third level if they need to. And so when that happens, that just kind of ends up giving that offensive lineman that offensive line the opportunity to have time to move um develop those blocks develop those holes and then the running back gets time to be patient and read sort of where those are opening up and every sort of outside zone run comes with three different options for that running back to be able to cut outside cut back inside to the middle or be able to bounce it back around to the outside and reverse field which is like last you know that's obviously like you know, last ditch effort, last resort kind of stuff. And so um, I think seeing a bit of that is, is the other piece. And, and so I think about the, the run before, right before Christian McCaffrey fumbled in the opening drive in the Super Bowl for San Francisco, you had Debo Samuel run that orbit motion to where he was lined up tight mm -hmm. to the line, uh, to the offensive line, ran all the way around the quarterback who had Brock Purdy. He had Christian McCaffrey and Kyle Juszczyk on his hips. How nice is that for a quarterback, by the way? And then Debo Samuel, maybe it was Juwan Jennings runs that motion all the way around. They snap the ball while some of the defensive eyes go that way. The box gets lightened up a little bit. You get a guard that pulls. Just like a lot of movement happening. And then the athletic offensive line paves the way for Christian McCaffrey to run for eight yards. Then he turns around. He fights for an additional four, picks up 12 yards on the play. Those types of things, I think, are, are the other pieces that maybe aren't the big plays downfield, that maybe aren't the you know passing plays that draw a lot of excitement and draw a lot of attention. But that run game, which we've seen over and over again, and especially with some of the incoming staff that we expect to be there, John Benton, uh, Rick Dennison. I mean, these are all guys that have, have put together very, very good run games in the past. And so I would expect to continue to see a bit more of a, a lean into, you know, 40% of the Saints offensive plays in 2024 going to the run game, things like that. I'm glad you said a couple of things because you hinted, you said offensive line so many times, mm -hmm. right? Yep. This doesn't work unless you have a good offensive line 100%. and an athletic offensive yeah. line. So athleticism, I could see it guys like Eric McCoy, you get Cesar Ruiz in space. And I mean, mm -hmm. Andres Pete too, but of course he's a free agent. But this offensive line for the Saints, that's kind of a little bit of my main concern. And I've mm -hmm. wrote about it plenty. We've talked about it plenty. I think between the offensive line, the defensive line, those are probably two biggest areas the Saints team has got to address. And this is not the year 
that you go in the first round and take the project guy with a good RAS score with all this, yeah. you know, from the D2 was all these measurables and all this stuff. This isn't the year. I think they have to go with a veteran offensive lineman, whether it's a guard or tackle, or hopefully both. They got to swing for the fences on a pass rusher, but this does not work properly unless you have the athletic, talent on the offensive line and you have guys that can back those guys yep. up right yeah and i think you have to invest in this in this off season for this offensive line i don't think you can walk in with this year's offensive line especially with the question marks that you have will andrews pete be back if he is what position is he playing what's going to happen in terms of the development of trevor penning will they be more patient around that with this new offensive staff or will they become a less patient since it's not their guy that they you know that they went out there and, and wanted to draft to get into the system what's going to happen with ryan ramchek is he healthy is he not does he have the offseason surgery is he available for the 2024 season and if he is is he available week one so i think you have to invest here and there are some players out there dalton reisner is somebody that in 2021 played under um clint kubiak in minnesota he spent some time in denver as well which was also a stop for clint kubiak uh you know and then you look at the a just incredible draft class of offensive linemen that we have coming up here in the 2024 draft which we'll get to draft stuff later on but i mean Goodness, like it's a good year to need to rebuild your offensive line, believe it or not. And so I'm very interested to see how the Saints end up investing in that, right? Because you're going to do it in free agency and in the draft. You're not going to wait around for the draft to get that done. So I'm really interested to see how they go about it. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up Dalton Reisner. I mean, look, I, I wrote about it. I put my way too early offensive line or offensive free agent targets, which people kind of shot me a little bit because I, I suggested Carson Wentz and, and uh, Sam Darnold as a potential backup, but it makes sense when you're trying yeah. to employ this system, right? And we don't know if Jameis Winston is going to be back, but with mm -hmm. Dalton, he played the waiting game last year and it did not work for him, right? He right. waited until like almost the last possible moment to get on a team in free agency where he should have been probably one of the priorities for some team to get him. And so I like him too. There's a lot of them. The Pats got a couple of tackles as Cleveland's another one, obviously yep. there's going to be some guys that make some pretty good money, but you bring up a really good point in the fact that this is a very, very rich offensive line class. And so I don't know if that's going to affect the market some because teams can be like, all right, we're going to pay you this much, but we also like this guy in the first round. So we could probably get him keep them for four years, be able to pick them up fifth year option and just not have to pay you as much as what we might get out of somebody who could be a day one starter. So yeah. I think that's something that you obviously would look at. And, you know, Saints, they have what, number 14 and 45 overall. Again, this team believes in building from the trenches within. Now, whether you agree, disagree, it makes sense. They have to give this offensive line some some attention. I think, they again, they have to get a pass rusher, too. I think that's what they're looking, or somebody on the interior. I just don't think this team has, when you look at the playoff teams, and, again, we're still talking offensive line, but I, one of my points on the defensive line is you don't have that guy who can take over a game. You don't have a, a, a Bosa. You don't have an Aaron Donald. Right. You don't have an Aiden Hutchinson. You don't have that right now on the roster, in my opinion. I mean, and, of course, something could change. You could get more out of it, right? But – you need somebody who can, when it's time to make a big play in the biggest moment of the game, you need that game changer, right? And I think that's what the Saints have got to look at. You know, there's going to be some pass rushers out there. Daniel Hunter obviously is a big one to look at. I mean, you know, there's just tons and tons of pass rushers that are going to be in the market. Do you have any favorites? And you agree, disagree? Yeah, no, I completely agree. But uh, for me, the guy that I look at a lot is – and this is this might be wild, but for me, it's Leonard Floyd. Like Leonard Floyd's one of the mm. better ones in this year's class. That's kind of manageable, right? That's that's a realistic option and things like that. Just came off of a one year deal, I believe, in Buffalo. Uh, has had nine to ten and a half sacks most seasons here recently, but then kind of saw that trickle down a little bit last year. And I think that works in the Saints' advantage. I think that what they've learned between. Carl Granderson, Zach Bond, Cade Nellis over the course of the past couple of years is that athleticism speed off the edge works in this this day's league uh, a little bit, not more, but works in different ways than size, right? We know the Saints prototype. They like big, they like stocky, they like, you know, they like all that. And I get that. 
But I think if we've seen the value that a speed rusher off the edge offers to this team, if you're looking for somebody that's going to come in and kind of be that situational pass rusher, that third down guy, I thought I, I touted Justin Houston last year as somebody for them to maybe invest in just to kind of see if they can get somebody to rotate in on those third and long, obvious passing down situations, effectively do what Zach Bond did toward the end of the year. A guy like, Leonard Floyd is a veteran who has done that before and can do it in your system. And then I think reinvesting in Zach Bond might be a great option for them too. They can solve it in house almost by say, believing what Zach Bond just showed you toward the end of the season, bringing him back and allowing him to play that role a little bit more as a pass rusher, as opposed to a coverage linebacker and then reinvesting in linebacker in another way. That's another guy that I really like along with a, fantastic again really good edge rusher class coming up pass rusher class coming up in this year's draft so in addition to what you might do in free agency you can also double back or maybe even double up if you will at that at that spot in the draft yeah i like you the fact you talk about speed because i think mm -hmm. when you look at trevor pinning's first games he played the titans and the panthers totally a lot of speed off that edge right yeah, and it's RDT, not the typical Brian Burns, like man. right which it's not a typical i mean you're looking at three four defenses and stuff like that i mean it's just not typical and in, in, in a lot of ways he got worked in some of that in the past bro and the thing is he tells us the most he's aware of his problems he knows it's his footing it's his pad level it's his hands it's all those types of things and and look the saints believe that he can put it together still but he's really got to show something here and so again i like the fact that in with zach bond i don't know why it took so long to just kind of figure that out but you know it's interesting because if i'm a three four team and kind of maybe pick up on that you might be able to outbid the Saints, you know, and, and he's a guy that might get a little bit of extra dollars if they see him as a 3-4 a rusher potentially. And so it's it's possible. But, you know, again, a free agency, the Saints are going to have money to spend. So let's not kid ourselves, right? You see it every single year. They don't have cap money. They're so over the cap. 82 million. We've seen 100 million, 90 something million. They find a way. They'll do it. They'll get the math and they will spend players. Now, I understand people talking about the kick the can philosophy, all this other stuff. And the thing is, if it works, nobody cares, but it hasn't worked for three years. So this is a really, really high pressure situation because. You know, if it doesn't work this year and DA gets ousted or and you just have this aging team, it's not like you can completely strip it down to the bones, right? You still have a lot of guys you're going to have to deal with and pay and financials and all this. But it's an interesting time for this Saints team. And look, I know that they feel like they're, they're in a position to compete. And you saw the NFC. Not really impressed by the NFC. San Francisco obviously was the cream of the pro crop. You saw Philly just fall off the face of the planet. You love what Detroit was able to do. But I think this NFC, when you look at it now, and of course, the fun part about mock drafts is we haven't even gone through free agency. And so I like right. to see free agency first before we get into the huge draft stuff. But this team potentially could, with all the, the new tools, the offensive staff, giving proper attention where it needs to be, they could find themselves as a contender this next season. Oh yeah, for sure. And look, I mean, there have been some teams within the, within the division that have done some good work. Atlanta did some good work bringing in Raheem Morris, adding Zach Robinson as their OC. We'll see what happens with the offensive coordinator change over in Tampa, but Liam Cohen is somebody that the saints liked a few years ago, as far as I understand it as a potential play caller in OC. So, you know, they'll have some competition and things like that, but look, they're going to be able to be in a position to compete as long as these changes work out. And as long as the offensive line gets addressed, whether that is addressed because they reinvest in new players, whether that's addressed because they get the development out of the players that they need and already have, whatever it might be, that like they're going to be in position to be able to do that. That's why you do what you do and not or do it, do what they did this off season. And, you know, scrap that offensive coaching staff with basically, I mean, position coach wise, everyone but Clancy Barone uh, ended up leaving yep. the tight ends coach. Uh, and so, you know, you go in there, you rebuild that. The Saints did that on the defensive staff uh, ahead of 2023 and jumped up you know, at eight, you know, 11 interceptions were added to that. They had allowed fewer, I believe it was fewer passing yards and, and or fewer rushing yards and a little bit more in terms of passing yards, but not by much. It was less than 500 yards. Hey, they, they, it worked. And so you're hoping to see the same thing over on the offensive side. And look, if it doesn't, 
you take your medicine for a year and then you're, you're back into being in a situation to where you're ready to kick the can down the road and start the whole process over again. You, you pull a Tampa 2023 and you go, okay, well, mm -hmm. we're going to grab this quarterback and try to compete still and have the talent that you do have for that year. But you mostly take your medicine for 2025. Then you're back at it again in 2026. Like all the people that get upset about the new Orleans Saints salary cap situation and, Oh, it's eventually going to catch up with them. They're going to have to take their medicine, blah, blah, blah. We're talking about, 15 years of competing one year of a reset button, and then you're effectively ready to start building again the year after you'll still have some things you have to pay off in 26, but uh, you can take the majority of it in 25. So it's not the end of the world. Uh, but I think that what you're looking for from this new Orleans saints team is to be competitive and be a playoff team here in 2024. And anything less than that's going to be a, a bit disappointing for sure. Yeah, and it's got to lead to some accountability. I mean, you just yeah, cannot afford sure. to miss the playoffs for a fourth straight year. And, you know, again, the, the philosophy and the way for those who just don't understand, like the salary cap is expected to rise every single year. And it has right. up until it had up until COVID. And so there's broadcasting deals, all this stuff. So it's just a sense that, you know, I remember the day what back in when it was first the thing is like thirty five million dollars. And now we're up to two hundred and thirty <laughs> plus. I mean, it's just insane. But right. again, that's what they kind of bank on is that, you know, you can kind of push some of this because the salary cap does rise for every year. You're going to get more things, broadcast deals, all this type of stuff yep. that should help out the financial picture. And so it makes sense that, you know, again, you got to, to look at everything. They're going to have to make some tough decisions. They're going to have to figure out what to do with Jameis Winston. They're going to have to figure out what to do with Andres Pete, Michael Thomas. I think that's probably a wrap for Michael Thomas in New Orleans. Yeah. They've got to figure out, are they going to move Marshawn Lattimore? You know, is that a, a viable option? I think there's cut candidates that we're going to look at. Marcus May is probably one of the prime candidates that I'd say. And, and so mm -hmm. they can make money appear. But how they get there is just what's going to be fascinating. And one thing I will say, they're not trading Alvin Kamara to the Ravens for a seventh oh round pick. I don't know oh what goodness. somebody was oh thinking in that genius pro <laughs> trade proposal. <laughs> what? That's like that was I'm saying, wild. That yeah, was I'm wild. A, I'm an that... upgrade to a Tesla for a, a Pinto. You know what I'm saying? Like, come on, man. Yeah, yeah that that's the work. that that's the classic. Like, uh, you ever seen? Um, Oh, I can't remember what movie it was, but it was Chris Rock's first movie when he just wants one rib. <laughs> you know, like, I'll give you, just give me one rib. Like that, that's one what rib. that trade just proposal one. was for me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And everything. And it was wild. And and I feel bad because it was it was our our Ravens guy over at Locked On was the one that yeah. tweeted yeah. it out, sharing it and everything. Everybody thought that he mm. was the one that was proposing it. But uh, yeah, no, Alvin Kamara is not getting traded anywhere for a seventh round pick in 2024. That's definitely not happening. <laughs> Yeah, you're gonna have to riot if that happens. So I mean, it just it just doesn't make sense. But again, Not off season all. fun is coming. You got the combine uh, in in a couple of weeks. We'll be out there, and we yep. got the HBCU Legacy Bowl in the combine <laughs> coming up tomorrow on Monday. That's gonna be really exciting. See a lot of local prospects it's gonna be held in the Saints' backyard and such. So real fun times that's coming ahead. I know people are like, oh, I miss football because this is the first Sunday without football, and it'll be the last Sunday for a while until at least until the UFL kicks yeah. off in march so i think that's that'll help fill some time but obviously you know sticking with more saint stuff this was one of the late recent ones heating up obviously and in, in everything that i've been told it's it's probably going to be a done deal but saints picking up and moving training camp up to california that's something that obviously they're doing some renovation there's renovation going on in the cafeteria there's been renovations since last year Maybe it's taking a little bit longer than what they anticipated, but that's one of the reasons why they're not going to be in Metairie next season so, or this yeah. in, in the summer. But California, it's supposed to be Irvine. They were out in Costa Mesa doing joint practices. Now, the league can obviously set things up to where, you know, they can play two West Coast teams out there because they're going to play two road games instead of just uh, two home games for the preseason and then presumably come back for the last week in Metairie and give, you know, fans a little bit of something. But are you surprised by this? I mean, this is something DA talked about last year. I mean, that was a possibility, and this is kind of where things are going, and I get some fans are upset about it, but this is a, a thing. Do you like the move? Do you think it's necessary, or you hate it? Yeah, no, I, I don't hate it. Um, I think it sinks for hometown fans when stuff like this happens, but at least they're doing it for an understandable reason, and it's not just like a wild hair. 
And, you know, instead it's, there's, there's a real purpose behind it. I assume that they'll probably try to come back early enough to maybe do like a week of practice in Metairie or something like that before the preseason begins and all, or, or sorry, before the regular season begins, or maybe their last home game or their last preseason game is the home game or something like that. Like they'll have those different things, but uh, this is something that we've known was a possibility since we were in California for the joint practices with the chargers. We knew of some of the places that were kind of on the list, including of course the dreaded green briar for saints fans and things like that uh so this is obviously the better choice i personally love it on a personal level because i graduated from uc irvine and mm. so it's a little bit of a trip home for me for the alma mater uh but the reason why i really like this is i think one of the big questions that a lot of people have been asking is you know yeah uh, is, is changing the offensive system really the right idea because won't it take them time to be able to get it you know under their wing or whatever them being a, away from home kind of helps that situation. You eat football, you you live football, you have football, you sleep football, like you practice football, like everything that you do, you do as a team and usually is football related. You go, you know, to an a fundraiser event, you're doing it with your teammates. You go yep. out for, you know, a you know, a, a day at some, you know, park or something like that, or you go out to the beach, you're doing it with teammates. You're doing film study. Cam Jordan talked about this at the end of the season that, you know, the way that technology has progressed within the NFL, it's the surface tablets that everybody has. So everybody kind of does their extra film study away from the facility at home. Now you're in the team you're you're in the team hotel and you're with other people and you're working and you're communicating and things like that. So I think that that could help to alleviate some of the hurdles that might come with the new offensive system. And I also think that all together, it kind of helps to bring the bond together a little bit that they'll be around one another constantly. And so I, I think that it's a good thing. Um, and it gets them away from the weather and all this other stuff too. Ideally, I don't know. Last year there was a hurricane over there. There were none, none here, so who knows really? Uh, but yeah, no, I, I like it. I think it's for a good reason. I hate it for the fan perspective of it because you want to be out there at training camp. But uh, I think with this being a good reason to have it done, it has its benefits. Yeah, you're bringing up painful memories, man. I got to, I had to, <laughs> the first tropical storm to hit the California coast since 1939 and i'm there for it and i have to experience an earthquake in the same day at sofi stadium and you almost like, had the lightning what? delay because sofi yes. even though it's got the glass roof it's technically what? an outdoor stadium because of the fact that there's like open areas open air areas and stuff like that like it was wild for y'all I'm, I, I, mean, I did not make that trip i did not stay for the preseason game uh, I do not envy those of you that did. <laughs> yeah, it was a really weird one. And I, out of uh, 10, I'd say negative 10 to, uh, to recommend <laughs> experience both of those in the same day. But, you know, you talk about, again, training camp. So one of the things DA did change when it, he brought on board is that, you know, typically when Sean was here, the players, they'd stay up in the team hotel. They do all of that. DA let his veterans go home for yeah. every night, right? Because they're around New Orleans and stuff. So I like the fact that not that the veterans can't have their their cake and eat it too, but I, again, you brought up the the chemistry, just being able to to have these veterans work hands on with a lot of these players. Yeah. I like that the fact yeah. that they're going to be able to do that this season, and and I, I think it's going to reap rewards because you just don't have all the stuff that comes out. And then look again, no matter what, even in even last season, season before when they hit rock bottom in Pittsburgh you never got a sense that this locker room was just completely divided. And at least when we were in there, right. I mean, you right. always talk to guys, they were still upbeat, positive, all this stuff. And same thing that I got, but you know, something's got to change when you miss the playoffs three straight years, you just can't yep. do the same thing again. It's in a definition of insanity doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. It just doesn't work. So I'm glad they're giving a different attention approach for the offense. I'm glad they're looking at something different for training camp. And, and I think they're going to be looking at different people and different players in this free agency and draft. And I think in a lot of ways that's exciting. And so again, they got to do something and, it's not like the division is going to get real strong overnight. You know, there's right. some pieces there and, and, and exciting things. Raheem Morris, again, you mentioned him. I'm really excited about him. He's he's extremely well respected around the league. And then you get Zach Robinson. If they get a quarterback in Atlanta, they might have something, but they got to get yeah. a quarterback first. They got to get so, a quarterback, though. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, you could look at a Russell Wilson. Maybe he's a guy that might get you a stopgap quarterback at this point or. 
does does uh, Kirk Cousins leave Minnesota? Cousins I mean, there's just one, yeah. so many things that could happen, and I think that's what's so exciting about free agency is there are so much movement that's possible that you just don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, and I anybody mean, that tells you that they do, they're lying. By the way, they're lying. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, exactly. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Yeah, absolutely. So again, we talk a little bit more. Just uh, talking about Clint Kubiak. Just overall, Andrew Janako is expected to be the mm-hmm. quarterbacks coach. He worked with Justin Fields last year, uh, and then he worked with Kirk Cousins. Since I just talked about Kirk Cousins, I want to bring him up. So he's going to work very intelligent, right? Yeah. So, and what's interesting too is Kubiak. He turns 37 in just, I think he actually just turned 37, but it was like this time frame that he was 36 coming on board. He's going to be 37 this month. They're getting a little bit younger on their staff too compared to what they were. Now, of course, with Benton and Derringer, they're a little bit older, but the season, I like the mix. And Clancy Barone, who you talked about, he has ties with Kubiak, so that obviously made sense too. And look, I think there's a lot to unlock at that tight end position, but I'm really intrigued with Andrew Janako working with Derek Carr. I think between Kubiak and Janako, look, your assessment of Derek Carr's season, and then what do you think he needs to maybe do better, and what could Janako maybe help him out with? Yeah. Uh, his season was such a tumultuous one because there was a lot of good. There was a lot of, there was a lot of not so good as well. Um, and, and I know that, you know, everybody loves to sell the bad when it comes to Derek Carr, but there were good things that he did too, but th- such a yeah. rocky start at the beginning, like the impatience with teammates, things like that really shown through a couple of times, even so much to a point where he had like that kind of bout with Pete Carmichael on the sideline and stuff like that too. And so just kind of being able to grow past that, not grow, but you know, grow more comfortable within the offensive spectrum so that he was, or offensive scheme. So that he was able to really kind of get past that. I thought that toward the end of the year, you really saw, you know, him trusting the receivers. You I mean, that Atlanta game where he's throwing contested catch opportunities to AT Perry, Rashid Shahid and Chris Olave, like all of the trust was absolutely there. He reads the field. Well, he's a quick processor. Um, I mean, let's be fair. He took care of the ball. Didn't have many interceptions. Didn't throw a ton of interceptions. Didn't put a lot on the ground. Things like that. Um, got really comfortable uh, throwing the ball away, getting rid of the ball, even taking off on his own at certain points too. That's why you saw the sack numbers come down, even though the pressure percentages were still uh, pretty consistent across the board. So I think he navigated all those challenges well. Um, but look, I mean, you know, he struggles throwing crossing routes against, uh, you know, in the middle of the field. That's going to be big in this Kubiak system. Like, not even from a Shanahan perspective, but from a Kubiak perspective. Like Gary Kubiak's offense, love the crossing routes, loves to be able to, you know, intertwine all that. But it'll put him, I think, in a little bit more of a comfortable situation, running a lot more play action, being able to diagnose before the snap. You know, you have a. Uh, somebody lines up in the backfield, say Alvin Kamara is in the backfield, you motion him out wide, or you have a fullback that lines up in the backfield, motion him out wide. If a linebacker goes with them, then it's man coverage. If he's matched up with the corner, it's zone coverage. And then you know, you know what I mean? And so like those little things I think will help a ton. And to your point about Kirk Cousins, the other reason why it's good to bring Kirk Cousins up and Andrew Janako's time with Kirk Cousins is because I think that Kirk Cousins is a more comparable quarterback than or to Derek Carr than Justin Fields is. I don't think that that's a huge take at all. (laughs) And so seeing 4,221 yards, 33 touchdowns, seven interceptions, and the fourth highest volume of his career, Kirk Cousins back in 2021 at that time, um, I think that seeing the success with Clint Kubiak and Andrew Janako with Kirk Cousins is translatable to Derek Carr. Now, Kirk had to do a lot of that too, changing plays, the line of scrimmage, stuff like that. Clint Kubiak was a very young, green offensive coordinator and play caller at that time. He was calling his dad's system uh, effectively. And so now, you know, you give him two years with Russell Wilson, you give him a year with Kyle Shanahan and see how he's grown. I think that those two should be able to progress together. Derek Carr was far from perfect in 2023, but I do think that he has the tools that are necessary to be able to operate the system that's incoming with Clint Kubiak for sure. Yeah, and I mean, car played hurt. I mean, I don't know yeah, how the guy played. Too. You that's know, he too. came off those yeah. concussions, the fractured rib or whatever, all the ribs, injuries, the shoulder Jeez, injuries. Man. I think he was talking about how it was like almost torn and stuff. And I'm mm-hmm. like, I don't know how this guy's playing. But again, guy like Derek Carr, similar to Drew Brees, similar to what Jameis Winston. I They just want to go out and be there for their team and, and want to win games. I mean, I, I get that. Yeah. And that's certain respect of it and, and such. But again, I, I think 
obviously the first year, I think he did pretty well, you know, in some aspects. I don't think it was perfect at all. I wouldn't put all the blame on him. You know, I think that there was times – the thing that – most people have learned about the Saints, and it's me especially, but if this team doesn't play in sync, they just don't win games. Yeah. And it's like, and I get that that's like the most football thing. Yeah, you want all three phases playing in sync when the offense and defense, but the Saints aren't a team that can benefit from one of their areas falling off, right? They just yeah. can't win. So if their offense is doing, their defense isn't doing it they can't win. If the defense is doing their thing, offense can't move the football. They just can't win. They just don't have that fortune. I don't know why that is, but yeah, they just I, don't, they can't do it. Yeah. I found a lot of that. I think we've seen a lot of that, particularly on the offensive side, right? Like the, the questions that we would mm. ask, why, why not more Taysom Hill? Why, yeah. you know, did you get away from Jimmy the running Graham. game? Why, <laughs> all, why, why no Jimmy Graham, right? All those yeah. other things. And, yeah. and the answer was always like, um, Oh, you know, the game situation dictated this, that, and the other, which to me meant uh, we have a very specific means of utilizing these players. And if 100% of that criteria is not met, or if a majority of that criteria is not met, then getting away from the player seemed to be the habit. And that did not make any sense to me. I look no. forward to, hopefully with Clint Kubiak, a little bit more willingness to stick to what works despite adversity, which we saw not only not only – Pete Carmichael, but I think we saw some some of that in Derek Carr too. With you know, there was a point where he was leading the NFL in like checkdown percentage or something like that. Yeah. And, and look, I'm never against the checkdown. If the option is force a ball into into you know triple coverage in the AFC Championship game or check the ball down, the answer is check the ball down, right? Yeah. I, I say AFC Championship game because I'm making reference of one of the passes that like Lamar Jackson threw. Yeah, for exactly. Um, so what? Yeah. And like, you don't want to, you don't want to fall victim to that. And so, uh, but I do think that every now and then, and what you saw toward the end of the season was look, Chris Olave's downfield. He's got one-on-one. -on -one. It's not perfect, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't try it. No. Rashid Jaheed's, you know, blazing down the middle of the field. It's not perfect because the safety was still like still underneath. He was still there, but uh, let's give it a try, right? Like, I think that those things do have benefits to where it, even though 100% of the criteria under which like, okay, if these th sets of things have to be true in order to use Taysom Hill, that shouldn't be the case. The identity should prevail at all times. And I'm hoping that we see that more from Clint Kubiak. And because of that, we'll see the confidence in Derek Carr to continue to do that like we saw toward the end of the season. Yeah, and it's just one of those, it, it's a perfect harmony. Like I think about yeah. the Bucks game and when your offense is puts up points on the board, your defense is stopping and suddenly you see more of a pass rush getting home because yes. you're able yeah. to get employ that. And then, you know, vice versa. When your defense is doing and give you the opportunities, the offense, just put points up on the board. Again, it's like football one-on-one, -on -one, but again, the Saints have got to have that harmony to be able to do that in the first place. Right. And so I'm excited to see where things go. And, and of course, I think we have an idea of the personnel, some of them, but there's still a lot of gaps here. There's still a lot to figure out for this for team. Sure. And, you know, I, one of the other people I think you talked about, Shahid, I think somebody who could really benefit from the system is Kendra Miller. I think he's somebody that really, really can benefit from this attack. And, and so we saw it. I, I get it. it. They passed on Ty J Spears. They got Kendra Miller. Didn't have it. He had an injury coming off of college. He got hurt in training camp, wasn't ready. All these things gets hurt, Bears game, and then we never see him ever again until right. close to the finale. And I mean, it's really weird. No setback, but you know, he had some other issues. I wouldn't call it a setback, right? Was the yeah. word. But uh, again, it, it's one of those that I think he is somebody that really has to to get up because you look at this yeah. draft class from last year. I, they got what they wanted and got what they needed from Brian Brzee they hit really good gold on Jordan Howden. I think yeah, they did time. a phenomenal job with their day three picks and A.T. Perry too. But you look at those middle picks, Foskey, Kendra Miller, and then, uh, you know, it just looking at how that just didn't work. It just yeah. was not. And Sal DeVere was another one too. And, and so these guys, I think, are facing a good one. And we talked to Jeff Ireland too, just speaking of Sal DeVere is, you know, it was interesting to kind of their take on Saldivari and Penning is that we see these guys that can compete for starting roles, not saying that they're going to be starters, but they can compete for starting roles and then at worst case be depth. I thought that was pretty interesting to hear from Ireland when we're there at the uh, Senior Bowl.
Yeah, for sure. And I think that some of that too might have been a little bit of a, a, a knowingness of what's on mm -hmm. the way, right? Like yeah. those are guys that were drafted into a specific system. Uh, yeah. Now you're wondering, okay, can they translate to this next system? And by all intents and purposes, like Trevor Penning's athleticism, Trevor Penning's run blocking, all those things should translate to this Clint Kubiak system. In fact, this might be a better fit for Trevor Penning than the last system was for him, right? The one that they were trying to fit in. And I think there will be elements of that old system, elements of the Kubiak system, elements of the Shanahan system, which are effectively the same with some small adjustments. Things like a larger route tree in the Shanahan system, all these other things. But I think that from the emphasis of the run game, this is a good situation for Trevor Penning to, to come into. And to your point about Kendra Miller, Kendra Miller ran the majority of his rushes the season that got him drafted at TCU, his senior season, I think it was 119 zone run attempts during that time to 101. So he ran the majority of his rushes in zone run, which I think is what we're expecting to see yep. come here to New Orleans. So that's another way that Kendra kind of gets a little bit of a boost in this new offense. I think the, the two players that I'm most sort of concerned about with the new system because I think you know, there's a lot of good things coming with the system, but there's some yep. things that change in a way that aren't good fits. The two players that I'm most worried about are are Trevor Penning, who we just discussed. But I think that there's a chance that the system actually works better for him, but it could go one way or another. And then Jamal Williams, I'm a little bit worried about yeah. in this situation too, because they see, it's not necessarily about Jamal Williams' talent though. It's just the way that he's seen. He's seen as this power man gap scheme up the middle runner, even though he has the athleticism to do a lot of different things, slim down to 215 pounds before the season in 2023 and got one touchdown on the most controversial rushing touchdown of the season. Um, uh, you know, do they, is the way that Jamal Williams is viewed, not, not who he is, but the way that he's viewed, is that going to be a hindrance to his ability to get the opportunity to fit into this system? And so that's the, those are the two players that I'm most concerned about on the offensive side right now. Yeah. And you look at the running back market, there's going to be a lot of running back names. Obviously Derek Henry headlines that class, I'd say, but you know, you don't see a lot of running backs are going to get paid something, right? I it's just, right. I don't see the market changing on that for him. And Jamal Williams is a guy that, you know, I, I, he's a great teammate. He is awesome in the locker room. He's always willing to talk and, and to us and such, and just a heck of a personality, but mm -hmm. you know, they didn't really get what they needed out of him this year. And and again, you look at the saints running backs that that room, they were the only team that didn't have a running back that had a 20 yard carry or more. That was Taysom that did it, right? That's and so that's crazy. pretty yeah. insane to think. And, and Kendra got close in the final game, but it's like, <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's just kind of mind-blowing that you just can't get what you need out of that that production. And so, again, that's, I think, where you look at that, the zone reads or whatever that case may be. You got to get that production there. And, again, it doesn't happen unless you have the offensive line. And I think with pinning, one of the things Ireland talked about, they're not ruling out moving him to guard. I don't know if right. that's the smartest thing, but that's also also a possibility. And so maybe he goes inside to guard. Maybe you figure that out. I think with the way Andres Pete played, I think he was probably their best offensive lineman last year. I, I, I really think at times he was. And that's crazy because he wasn't even supposed to start. It right. was supposed to be pinning at, at left tackle, Hurst at left guard, mm -hmm. and Pete was just going to be your bench guy, right? And so right. injuries happen. Things happen. You put Pete left tackle, and he played excellent. And I don't know if that means he's going to get more money or anything like that, but, I mean, that matters. And, so. by the way, he missed one game. Right. Now, he has not missed uh, – like, he's missed, like, several games every single year since he was drafted. He only missed one game. Nobody really talks about it. I made sure to point it out, but this is a guy that everybody talks about has made a glass, all this other stuff, but he only missed one game this year. And so yeah. – it's it's hopefully that's a good encouraging sign. But if I'm the Saints, do I look at trying to bring somebody like him back? Essentially, is it is it run it back and get these guys that we have that we believe in that can fit this system, or is it let's cut our losses, let's figure out the financial ramifications of it, and just go find our guys that we really want for the system? Yeah, I 
think it's going to be the latter. I mean, it's what makes the most sense, right? I mean, you're you're revamping your offensive coaching staff. You've added in a, a run game coordinator, which you didn't have by title last year after moving on from Dan Rochard. You never really replaced by title, at least, that, that responsibility. Yeah. It looks like they're adding Rick Dennison to hold that role, or maybe he's a senior offensive assistant, but it sounds like his involvement is going to be between offensive line and running backs organizing and coordinating that run game. John Benton is a guy that's expected to be the offensive line coach and every single place that he's shown up, they've been, you know, bottom in rushing bottom in terms of, or, or I guess top too many sacks allowed. And then over the course of time, you've seen them be go the opposite direction entirely. And, and so he's, he's got a track record of improving both of those things. And so I would be surprised if maybe they look at their opportunities to cut their losses. I think the Andrews Pete thing gets really, really complicated because if I'm Andrews Pete's representatives, I'm fighting for left tackle money. Once you play left oh, yeah, tackle in the course. NFL and you, yeah, once you start at left tackle in the NFL, you're going to get your representation and your team trying to push for left tackle money and a starting role as a left tackle somewhere else. And the NFL's offensive line play is horrific. It is so much worse than it used to be back in the day. And a lot of it is because of college. A lot of it's because of high school. The athletic players that want to play offensive line, they get moved to tight end. They get moved to defensive line. They get moved to other spots and stuff like that. And so offensive line talent across the NFL is hard to come by. And so I think you got to take swings uh, in free agency. You got to take swings in the draft and you got to be okay with cutting bait on guys that maybe you wouldn't otherwise want to cut bait with and that you try to bring back because you have to continuously be cycling sort of that talent as best as you can. Well, I'll tell you a team that I'd watch out for that might, if Pete gets available, I, I think it's Miami. I, I don't think Toronto oh, yeah. Armstead's going to play much longer. If anything, I don't think they can feel good about where he's at. You can go be their left tackle if you want. And, you know, if you get a bidding more with the Saints, you're probably going to win that, right? And so, I don't know. It just depends. He's he's back home in California. Obviously, he he actually just had another child uh, not that mm -hmm. long ago. So, uh, he's a big family man and stuff. But it's one of those that I don't know where, where those things go. And, and, of course, I hope to get some more insight. We should get some more insight when yeah. we're in the combine in a couple of weeks. Yeah. That's kind of where most of the chatter where we learn a lot. That's where we learned about Alante Taylor going in this, lot, this last year. We learned about kind of some of the plans for pinning, all these different things. So it's just mm -hmm. a lot of information that we will gather over the course of the next couple of months. And before you know it, it's combines. It's free agency. New league year is March 16th. Then we have the draft work, and then it kind of gets a little quiet until the schedule picks up. But we'll have like rookie camp, we'll have the tryout camp. Obviously, you'll have OTAs, mini camp, and then training camp. Like, I mean, we're Be here in a football you know sense it, <laughs> doing this, doing this full time, and this is the only thing we do. These months do go by. I feel like they go by fast for me. Yeah. You know, overall, I, I I know people are like it's it's only a few months, but I mean half the year. It's it's gung ho, all in. Like once we hit training camp, we don't stop until the Super Bowl, probably right. And so, yep. but we're still doing stuff. But uh, it's just that kind of time. But I'm excited about it. And so this is hopefully going to be a really good season. And um, you know, there's just a lot of things that the Saints team has got to answer real quick. And we're going to tackle plenty of that on future episodes and such. But Ross definitely want to see any final thoughts. Final thoughts from Ross. All right, final thoughts from us. Everybody take a seat. Yes. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> let me tell you all about the sixth ward. Uh, no, but I, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree with you, man. Like this, this is going to be a very fun and intriguing off season. I think that the thing that I highlight the most about this off season is change and change where it mm. needed to happen. You mentioned the definition of insanity earlier and that whole idea of like, if you do the same thing again and expect a different result, you're, you're that's, that's what that is. But this year, what we've seen is this team, take a new approach on offense, take a new approach in terms of their system there. I would be surprised if they take a new approach on the offensive line, as well as in other spots, they might take a new approach in terms of how they add to their prototypes and expand their prototypes to certain players, things like that. If you needed this team to make changes, which they needed to on the offensive side, they did that. And so I love the fact that they're swinging. Let's see if they can get on base, right? Like that, that becomes right. the next piece for them and everything like that. But uh, it, it's good to see sort of the, the swings that they're taking because you're not going to hit at all if you don't swing. And, and so I love seeing them at least 
taking this opportunity to say, okay, make the changes. Let's see, let's see, you know, what, what they can get accomplished with all of them. Yeah. I mean, and again, it's either going to work or it's not right. And it may not work day one. It may not work week one. And again, what everybody's got to remember is it doesn't matter how you start the season. All you want to do is play your best ball from Thanksgiving on really in December, you want to be playing your best ball. And I thought the saints with them playing the way they did, if they would have got in the postseason, I thought it would have been interesting. I'm not saying they would have won anything or done something. I just think they would have been a really interesting team the way they played. Mm-hmm. I mean, you look at Philly, the way they just dominated, and then they just fell. I mean, they fell to the crapper. I mean, there's no Good, really other way to just to tell it, you know, but yeah. it's just one of those that's like – if they can figure out and weather the storm, now they're going to have some tough opponents on the schedule. I mean, they got Kansas City. They're going to have Sean oh, yeah. Payton coming back. They got Dallas that's going to be on their schedule. Giants, Commanders, Eagles. I mean, they're they're not going to have an easy time on the schedule. But, you know, it's it's what we learned about this last season is the strength of schedule is is folly. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I, yeah. I don't I hadn't bought into that much. You know what I'm saying? Because yep. you're expected to get better most right. every year. So you're yep. not playing the same team, right? You know, and they're playing if I'm not mistaken five rookie head coach five new head coaches this season. So it'll be really fascinating. So they got Carolina, Atlanta, Los Angeles Chargers is another one, yep. Commanders is another one, Dan mm-hmm. Quinn so I'm, that's just off the top of my head, but yeah. there's one I'm missing. But uh I mean that's that's a big deal. And so yeah. I think that when you look at that it's it's wide open. And it's it's theirs if they want it, and it, it's going to take some real good coaching, real strong coaching, and real strong play to be able to turn this thing around. And we're just going to see what they're made of. And so I think it's it's a fascinating time, and it's really intriguing time. And I think, you know, I used to work in retail a long time, and we always talked about the holiday season. This is the most holiday, most important holiday season ever. I think this is the most important off season ever. I think this is the yeah. most important season approaching ever. Yeah, I would completely agree with that. I think uh, Raheem Morris is that that fifth coach, by the way, over in Atlanta, who they'll play twice as sort of that yeah. new new head coach. So, yeah, man, it's it, it's going to be a fun time. So I'm looking forward to seeing how it goes. Um, and 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 what else this team continues to do because there's still some things that they haven't done yet on the, even the coaching staff. You know, I mean, the wide receiver coach yet, although they interviewed Keith Williams, the assistant yep. wide receiver coach from the Baltimore Ravens, all that. Right. So it's going to be interesting to see how they continue to build all that out and and, and where it takes them here in 2024. So I'm excited. I'm excited. And I'm excited for this new show and not another opportunity to be able to continue to cover it with a with a very good friend. So I, I really yes. appreciate it. I say brother from another mother, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. And so it's uh it's fun. It's been a blast. So. Look, we want to just tell you that, hey, it's it's been a blast hosting this. It's been a blast to just be able to announce this and bring this to you. We'll hopefully do it at least once a week. We'll see how things ramp up. Um, obviously, nothing has changed on any of our other roles. So we're both still right. with Saints News Network. Ross is still doing his thing on Locked On. I'm still doing my thing with Boot Crew Media. So this is just, again, we felt it both necessary that, hey, let's – be able to talk about football. So we definitely want to uh, keep supporting all those guys. And of course, we're going to have to be a little bit greedy, like subscribe, all that fun stuff, spread the word, you know, it's just kind of the, the getting out of the gate type thing, but we just appreciate the support. Appreciate all you fan interactions to look. I, I, again, nobody is anything without fan support. Right. And I tell you, Saints fans are completely, 100% super passionate about their team. And I have loved, that's one of the reasons why I love covering this team because they are so passionate and they're so supportive and they're so once you, you can tell who's genuine and who's not right. And when they pick up on that, they love you to death. They'll, they'll do all these things. They'll say all these things. I mean, they'll get into a a Twitter war for you or go find somebody, go cut somebody, whatever you got to do. (laughs) Hopefully not really, but um, you know, it's just a refreshing sight to see. So look, we appreciate the sport and it's much more to come here. Um, Again, he is Ross Jackson. You see it at the bottom. Follow him, Ross Jackson Nola. You find me, John J. Hendricks. That's Hendricks, just like Jimmy. Hopefully, some people still get that reference. I'm getting <laughs> older, but you. yes, as long as Ross does, we're good. Now, if I ever here, say something good. outlandish, if I ever say something outlandish, just tell me. But at any rate, we appreciate you tuning in to the very first episode of Second and Saints. Much more to come, much more exciting things to come. Thanks, guys. Have a good one.